Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, my name is Celeste Seward. I'm the Patient Engagement Manager for the National Ataxia Foundation. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this webinar all about immune-mediated ataxia. Before we jump in to the fantastic talk we have ahead of us, uh, we just have a few housekeeping items to get to. If you want to advance the slide, fantastic. Thank you so much. So first things first, if you'd like closed captionings for this talk, you can turn them on by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you click that, captions will automatically show up so you can see what people are saying. Also, feel free to use the chat to, just like we are now sharing where we're from, to talk with other attendees. You can use that chat feature. If you have any specific questions, though, uh, that you would like for Dr. Wittick to discuss, at the end of her talk, uh, please use the Q&A feature. So again, at the bottom of your screen, there will be a button called Q&A. The icon has two little chat symbols or uh, speaking bubbles next to each other. So if you click that, uh, a window will open and you can type your question and pop it in. And feel free throughout the presentation to type your questions in there and then we'll save them all until the very end and then we'll get to go through questions. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So Dr. Natalie Wittick is an assistant professor at Rush University Medical Center. She graduated with highest honors from Boston University School of Medicine and completed her training at UCSF for residency and then completed subspecialty fellowship training in movement disorders and obtained a master's of clinical investigation at Rush University. She has uh, clinical and research interest in improving outcomes for patients with immune-mediated movement disorders, particularly those with immune-mediated ataxia. So she's a fantastic uh, speaker for today's talk, and she's very excited and happy to share with us about this topic today. Uh, so with that, Dr. Wittick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay still? Yes, we can. Good, good. So these are my disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest to discuss, and I'm very happy to talk about um, immune-mediated ataxia today. It's a lot to cover, so I will try to get through it fast so that we have time for questions and answers at the end. Thank you to everyone who has joined across the globe, essentially. So hopefully I do not disappoint. Um, and throughout this talk, I know some of you may be new to a diagnosis or interested in learning at it. And at the earliest stages, other people um, practically, thanks to Google, maybe have a PhD in this already. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to span um, as much as I can from simplifying things, but also discussing things in detail. So there's a little something for everyone. Um, so first let's talk about what is ataxia. So ataxia is not necessarily a diagnosis, but something that um, is a physical exam finding and symptom that we see. It encompasses abnormal coordination and balance, sometimes a tremor when trying to reach for things, um, but that tremor is not regular. It's actually just poor coordination reaching for things. Sometimes the walk will be abnormal, wide-based, and then the speech may be slurred. There may also be um, difficulty with tracking movements and some double vision associated with ataxia. And this is due to dysfunction of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is outlined here in this slide, and the cerebellum, the uh, one of the most common cells within the cerebellum is the Purkinje cell, and this is often a site of the immune attack. And so it can be quite overwhelming for patients with ataxia, um, as there are so many different causes of ataxia. And it's overwhelming for clinicians too, I have to say, on the other side, which is why I developed an interest in this, because it just seemed that patients and clinicians get lost in trying to find a cause. And Immune-mediated ataxia is unique from other causes of ataxia in that we have additional therapies that are not necessarily available to patients with other types of ataxia. And so it's important to identify patients with the immune-mediated ataxia group. And so it differs in other causes of ataxia in the sense that it's very uncommon to have a family history of ataxia. In fact, it's usually there's a family history of autoimmune disease. And in fact, too, with the autoimmune ataxia or immune-mediated ataxia, it tends to be a faster progression, maybe over days to weeks to months versus slowly progressing over years. Um, and patients may have, depending on what the causes of the immune-mediated ataxia, other neurologic symptoms like seizures, spasms, diarrhea, weight loss. Um, so we'll go through the different causes in detail. Um, so going back to the history, it wasn't, since it's a group of disorders that 
um, is encompassed under immune mediated ataxia. It's not like there is a one time point in history that it was discovered. The earliest report of a type of um, autoimmune attack causing ataxia was probably when Charcot presented on a patient with multiple sclerosis who had an intention tremor scanning speech and nystagmus. Of note now, multiple sclerosis, since we know that it affects multiple parts of the brain, is not categorized as an immune-needed ataxia, even though we do know it's an autoimmune disease that causes ataxia. So things, we'll get through the nuances later. Um, in 1990, there was the first reported case of a patient who had ovarian cancer and then developed ataxia. So that was the first reported case of what we call perineoplastic ataxia, and that's when the autoimmune autoimmune diseases associated with cancer. And then there was an explosion of new biomarkers in the 1980s of new antibodies, newly discovered antibodies, let's put it that way. They probably were around since, you know, <laughs> the beginning of time. Um, but we were able to identify them. And the list of antibodies that we know of continue to grow each year. And so those have been very helpful in helping us to make diagnoses. And then finally, in 2001, Honora and colleagues um, reported a case series of GAD 65 associated ataxia. And I believe he also will be speaking on this topic about research and therapeutics um, coming up on June 26. So don't miss out on that talk. Um, so let's go through the mechanisms of immune mediated ataxia. So in general, what causes an immune mediated ataxia? Yeah. So first there's a trigger. We may know the trigger. We may not. Maybe it was an infection, surgery um, for those with celiacs or gluten associated ataxia. Maybe it's gluten or in the case of perineoplastic, a hidden cancer, or we may not even know what the trigger was. But for whatever reason, the immune system gets confused and attacks its own nervous system instead of the outside invader. And this inflammation leads to neurologic damage and patients develop symptoms. So let's go back to the basics of the immune system. So often in talking about treatments, we'll talk about B and T cells. So I want you to have a basic understanding of these. So B cells, when activated, turn into plasma cells and release antibodies. And those are great when you're trying to battle, say, COVID or some other virus. And same thing, T cells can help to modulate and activate B cells known as the T helper cells, or they can directly kill um, certain cells that are either infected with a virus or tumor cells. And so um, a way that the body can get confused is when it sees an outside invader and it's mounting a response, but it gets confused and sees its own body as a target, something that needs to be attacked. And so this is thought to be uh, one of the basis of the autoimmune attack and multiple different conditions, not just immune needed cerebellar ataxia. And so often diseases in the nervous system will be designated as B cell mediated or T cell mediated, um, but it's much more complex than that. Um, the immune system is like a I would like to describe as a city with multiple different citizens. And although there's um, some cells that are specific to the brain and spinal cord compared to those in the blood and the other tissue within the body, there is a constant communication and the cells communicate with cytokines and other receptors. So although we talk about therapies and saying, oh, it decreases B cells or decreases T cells, the immune system is constantly communicating and the mechanism of disease for all the different uh, disorders under immune mediated ataxia differs. And that's why the presentation and symptoms may differ as well, but there is overlap in treatment. And as I mentioned, um, there have been um, multiple antibodies that have been discovered. And some of these antibodies are thought to be directly pathogenic, meaning the antibody itself is attacking a part of the nervous system that's necessary for the function of the nerve. And so if that's being attacked and that part of the nerve cannot function well, then it's going to lead to problems, neurologic problems. And so antibodies that have been discovered have been characterized um, based on what part of the nerve that they're attacking. And so certain antibodies may attack different parts of the nerve. 
And for example, ion channels, which are important for propagating signals, um, there are antibodies against that that are thought to be directly um, causing symptoms. And so in those conditions, we think if we can mop those up or remove those antibodies, we can reverse the neurologic symptom. Whereas other ones thought to be more T cell mediated where the T cell is attacking, it's a, sometimes harder to stop that process. As I mentioned, though, it's not quite that simplistic. It often, um, there's multiple things at play. And so we'll often try either of the therapies to try to improve symptoms. So this is a picture of a synaptic terminal of a nerve. And so you can see too that the adhesion molecules are also important to connect. And so that also is a site of particular antibodies. When I say antibodies, these are made by your own body attacking the nervous system. And so moving on from there, so multiple types of ataxia are known to be due to genetics. Now, there is not one particular gene that is associated with a immune-mediated ataxia, but I did want to talk about the genetics in particular because it's important to note that we inherit our ability um, for immune cells to detect the outside world from our parents. And so certain types of HLA molecules, which are the molecules on top of immune cells that help to detect outside invaders and um, to help with signaling of the immune system, those are inherited by genes that we receive from our parents. And so although there may not be a history of ataxia in your family, you may have a family history of an autoimmune disease, such as your mother has pernicious anemia um, or type 1 diabetes, or some other autoimmune condition. And we know that that increases your risk of developing an immune mediated ataxia. And so there has been, this um, figure is from a paper that looked at an association of these molecules, which are on the immune cell and showing that there is an increased risk depending on what type you inherited with developing a particular type of immune mediated ataxia called antiyoperineoplastic ataxia. So let's talk about um, moving on to the diagnosis, which is in part due to the pathology too. And so the um, Matoma and colleagues characterized immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia most recently in 2021, breaking down the ataxia into those that we have an identified trigger or a known cause and those that we may not know the trigger. Now, as I mentioned, multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune diseases such as lupus or Sjogren's, um, in some cases and sometimes sarcoidosis, other diseases um, may cause a autoimmune attack of the brain. But if the cerebellum is not the primary site, we don't usually characterize that as immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia. We're going to go through each of these disorders in detail so that we can talk about the presentation, um, workup, and then treatment. So this is kind of the umbrella term, which is immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia, and then we can break it down into those with the trigger, such as gluten ataxia, post-infectious cerebralitis, Miller-Fisher syndrome, opsoclonus myoclonus, and perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. And then those without a known trigger is the anti-GAD associated ataxia and primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia. So in trying to figure out what is the cause of the ataxia, the first step would be to have a clinical evaluation. And so when you see the neurologist, to just simplify things, you'll have a clear, you'll have a history, an exam, and then they will recommend additional diagnostic workup. For all my patients, I kind of break down the next steps into these three categories. What else do we have to do to figure out what's going on? How can I treat you now? And if we know you have an immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia, or if we discover it along the way, there are additional treatments that are available to you. And so the diagnostic workup is quite intensive and it can involve MRIs, several blood tests, 
uh, lumbar puncture or spinal tap, and then additional scans to look for triggers such as a cancer, um, including CT scans, and if we find something that looks concerning, a biopsy. So it is a team approach. There are a lot of providers involved, and so it can be overwhelming for the patient and family. So typically, I work with a number of different neurologists. So I'm a movement disorder trained neurologist who has a special interest in neuroimmunology, but often movement disorder neurologists do not have a background in neuroimmunology. So they'll also work with a neuroimmunologist, which is also known as like an MS specialist, um, but certain neuroimmunologists may have a particular interest in this too. And then if you do have seizures, there may be other neurologists involved too, like an epilepsy doctor. Um, in looking for the trigger, and if you find one, such as in celiacs, you may also see a GI specialist, or if you find a cancer, you will also have an oncologist who is key. Um, and then it is not, um, you know, the therapists are very important. The physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, also psychologist, um, having ataxia can be very depressing um, because you're used to your body functioning and then all of a sudden it's not anymore and it can be horribly depressing. So making sure to have a psychologist and psychiatrist are also important. And then finally, often the ataxia can be disabling and a social worker can be helpful in um, you know, getting disability or additional help that you may need. And so this is a long slide. This is a little bit more going into detail um, about what I think about as my initial workup for ataxic patients that I think of. Now, a lot of this is evaluating patients for immune-mediated ataxia. I go um, hunting for this often because of the potential um, additional therapies that I can offer, and it's something that I don't want to miss, especially early on. So if my patient is progressing fast over weeks to months, I will also recommend a lumbar puncture, and that's to look for at least secondary markers of inflammation and then also more specific markers like the antibiotics. And then also if somebody's progressing fast, I will also recommend looking for cancer. Um, not just the CT scan, but other age-appropriate cancer screening, such as mammogram, colonoscopy, and even a PET CT, which is hard in the United States for those outside um, to get approved. And so in the United States, we have a number of different antibody panels that we can send our samples off to. And so the green is what the panel um, uh, basically test for. So there's the number of antibodies continues to expand. These tend to be um, the ones that are uh, most closely associated with ataxia. There are more that come out every year and which ones, can, which panels can be sent um, and test for which antibodies. And so as you can see, if you have a negative antibody, say you sent it to a certain lab, you're more likely to miss that antibody. Now the panels are not perfect. There are false positives and false negatives. So just because you have an antibody does not mean that you have immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia. Just because you don't have an antibody doesn't mean that you don't have this condition. So we'll talk about that. Now, another condition that um, I will also test for is um, uh, the GAD-associated ataxia, and sometimes we'll send the stiff person panels too that are available. So going to the clinical care, just a brief overview, we'll get into the specifics later. In general, the reason why I want to make this diagnosis fast is because we want to stop the damage to the nervous system as fast as possible, thinking that we can reach a restorable stage. So the brain does not heal like the rest of our body. So we want to prevent the damage from continuing to occur to the point that it gets to this threshold that we can't swing back from. And so just like how stroke time is brain where seconds matter, I also think of the cerebellum and treatment of immune-mediated ataxia like time is brain. Maybe not seconds matter, but we do want to get treatment sooner than later. And so I do want to talk about some of the immune therapies just to give you a background, because I'm going to mention these throughout the talk. These are This is a very basic overview here. So IV immunoglobulin is pooled antibodies um, that volunteers, just like how you can donate your blood, you also can donate plasma and then the antibodies within that. Um, and so they pool that from hundreds of people and give it as an infusion. And so this is, there are different formulations. You could get it subcutaneously. The one that I most commonly give is IV infusion. 
Um, and then there is plasmapheresis, which is kind of the opposite in that we wash the body of its antibodies, similar to like a dialysis where you need a, a special line and need to be admitted to the hospital or at least in a very specialty infusion center where you can have those antibodies removed. And then steroids are a temporary fix when given IV. It can last for several weeks to kind of halt the immune system, kind of stuns multiple different cells that we talked about. And sometimes people will then be put on an oral steroid taper or meaning taking by mouth. Then there is rituximab and that is an IV infusion that it targets B cells. Um, so that is a more long-term solution for patients with antibody mediated immune um, ataxia. And that is a little longer lasting, at least up to six months, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And then cyclophosphamide is an IV infusion. That's a chemotherapy that primarily targets the T cells. So these are just wanted to give you a little bit of the basics because we'll be talking about these and I don't want to lose anyone. So those are some of the immune therapies that we'll talk about for specific conditions. But then there are the symptomatic therapies. So if we don't even know what's causing your at ataxia, there are symptomatic therapies that we can reach for while we're trying to do the workup. And so movement disorder specialists tend to feel more comfortable with the symptomatic therapies than the immune therapies, because often in the fellowship for movement disorders, it's rarely um, the training for those immune therapies are rarely included. So the symptomatic therapies, there was an American Academy of Neurology 2018 guidelines that were put out that said that there was at least moderate evidence for Riluzol. And Riluzol is actually a treatment for ALS, and it's relatively safe. It can cause liver toxicity, so we have to monitor the liver. And if you're, um, you don't have any concern that there's also liver disease, I often will not give this. And so it's given as 50 milligrams twice a day. And there's been a couple of studies that looked at multiple different causes of ataxia, and it tended to be helpful for different types of patients, regardless of the cause. They're small studies, but um, most <laughs> ataxia studies, uh, when they exist, are small. So this has the largest evidence. And so I use some of these papers to try to battle insurance companies because they often are like, but this patient doesn't have ALS. Why do you want that? And there is evidence supporting that. When I was in training, these were the ABCs of ataxia. And it has, these medications have insufficient or conflicting evidence for using an ataxia. Sometimes it can help. Other studies have shown that um, the data is here nor there. Um, amantadine um, can be nice because uh, patients don't want to go to the bathroom as much, kind of dries you out. Um, that's something we can reach for. Buspirone also treats anxiety. So as I mentioned, having ataxia can cause a lot of anxiety or depression. I often do not use vernacycline um, because of the side effects of personality change, but that is also something that is kind of you can try it, but it's not a robust response. Now, as you can see, the workup and treatment um, is quite complex. And sometimes when you're sitting in the room with the patient, when I'm trying to type out all the orders and I can barely get through all of them, I know it's going to be overwhelming for the patient and the family to actually complete those studies. So what I thought about was, well, would it be better if we just admitted patients to undergo their initial workup? And I looked at a a series of patients, about 78 patients who were suspected to have this condition. And those who were admitted were more likely to receive immunotherapy and they received it faster than those who started the workup as an outpatient. So for me, if you're seeing me, don't be surprised if I suggest, hey, or at least offer, do you want to just come to the hospital to get your MRI, get your CT scans, do the lumbar puncture all in one sitting instead of having to schedule multiple different visits and follow-ups um, as an outpatient, especially if you're having um, difficulty getting in because of mobility issues. And finally, as I mentioned, time is brain. So I'd rather know this information fast and treat as fast as possible. And so going through, well, why would I even think about coming in? How do you know or suspect an immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia? It's relatively common depending on the prevalence. So there was one study done um, that looked at 1,500 patients of ataxia and had a high percentage of patients with immune-mediated ataxia. 
Um, and then a number of those um, were undiagnosed still in that cohort. And did they have immune mediated ataxia and we weren't able to pick it up or not? It's kind of hard to tell. Um, for that cohort that I mentioned who underwent workup, for those who were admitted, um, that group of patients, I think there was a higher suspicion, um, which is why they got sent in and a higher percentage of those patients actually ended up having immune mediated cerebellar ataxia, almost 60%. So um, usually if there's a fast time course, we think of that. So going through each of these diseases, let's start off um, just with some basic information about each one. So gluten ataxia um, can have a various time course, um, is usually associated with diarrhea or constipation, malabsorption, weight loss, abdominal pain, and distension bloating. Um, there may be additional neurologic symptoms like neuropathy, um, headaches, anxiety, and maybe even epilepsy, though less likely. There are a number of different blood tests that you can do, which have um, good sensitivity and specificity. Those are terms that we use to describe how good a test is. The higher, the better. So um, usually we think of, there's no clear cutout that says, this is the best test if it's above you know, 85 or 90, but in general, I think of tests as being good, greater than 90. Um, and so if you do have just of note, um, a anti-gliadin antibody that's positive, that's either IgA or IgG, like through traditional methods, that's no longer recommended as it has false positivity. And then finally, to confirm, um, you can also undergo an endoscopy, which is a procedure where they do a small um, bowel biopsy, and then also do gene testing. As I mentioned, there's certain types of genes that are associated um, with autoimmune disease, particularly in celiacs. And so the treatment is gluten-free diet. And sometimes I will just recommend that to my patients with ataxia. Um, for those who are strong-willed, <laughs> for me, I, I don't think I could do that. Um, but for those of you who can, I commend you, you are strong. Um, and then also less common, usually with the gluten-free diet, patients can get better, but sometimes immune therapy such as IVIG, a different type of pill that you can take mycophenolate can be helpful or the rituximab infusion. So going to the next one, post-infectious cerebellitis. So I believe most of you joining are adults and probably, I don't know if you're joining because of your children, but this tends to happen more in kids, um, usually less than six years old. There are a number of different infections that can trigger this. And usually it happens pretty soon after, maybe weeks after the infectious event. Um, you do want to evaluate with sometimes with a lumbar puncture to rule out that the infection is what's causing the ataxia versus the autoimmune, which tends to happen afterwards. Um, and then there are the symptoms kind of overlap with other conditions. So if you have an active fever or headache and it's hard to bend your neck, that's called um, more concerning for meningitis and an actual infection and not the post-infectious cerebralitis. So that's something you want to rule out before um, reaching for the immune therapies, including steroids and IVIG. Um, but many patients will just make a full recovery on their own, even without the treatment. Um, so speaking of um, another immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia is Miller-Fisher syndrome. So for those, if you've had that, if patient, if you're ever asked during a vaccine, have you ever had a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome? This is a variant of that. And so it can present with a neuropathy as well, but one of the targets is the cerebellum or one of the predominant targets is the cerebellum, which is why it's classified under the immune-mediated cerebellar ataxias. And so patients will also have this characteristic difficulty moving their eyes and have that coordination problem, not just with their limbs, but also with their eyes, which separates from the other types of Guillain-Barre. And it is um, different than the other cases of Guillain-Barre in that there are particular autoantibodies listed here that have been associated, so you can test for those. Um, usually a lumbar puncture is done to look for um, if the protein is elevated. And then for the neuropathy, you may have a procedure called an EMG nerve conduction study, um, which I lovingly call the taser test. It's not a fun study. Um, they basically zap your nerves to see how well they're working and conducting. And then there's a needle similar to an acupuncture needle that is done to test and see how well the uh, muscles are responding to the nerves signal. And then it's also important because sometimes in Guillain-Barre, um, that the breathing can be affected. 
less likely for the Miss Miller Fisher variant, but you want to make sure that you have full respiratory capacity because sometimes very rarely people will need to be intubated. And then the treatment is the IVIG or plasmapheresis where they remove the um, antibodies. Um, the overall steroids are not recommended for this condition. So the other um, rare type of immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia is called opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. And so this is typically in children and the eyes will kind of dance around and have this characteristic um, fluttering. And so it's often called the dancing eye syndrome. And it's half of the time is associated with a tumor called the neuroblastoma and also can be associated with other tumors such as ovarian teratoma. And the treatment response tends to be best for those who we can remove the tumor and find that trigger and remove that. Um, and so although there are a number of tests that we can do to look, um, to make a diagnosis, and we know that this is an immune mediated process, we have still not identified the antibody that is causing this. So there are scientists who are looking for it still, um, but we have not been successful yet. But we can do all the other tests that we look for, looking for indirect markers of inflammation. And that dancing eye is quite classic. And so it's often easy to make a diagnosis clinically, but then we have to go hunting once again for the tumor to see if there's, um, if we could treat the tumor if we find it. And then also immune therapy is used, um, including there are different regimens that have been proposed um, and for this condition. So the other one uh, was characterized as perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. And so this one is associated with cancer. And um, the presentation tends to be quick when it initially starts, may have some nausea, vomiting, vertigo, um, weight loss, um, and progresses over days to months. And we do test for those antibodies. Um, we mentioned those um, antibody panels already. The MRI brain with and without may be normal um, or later on may show some cerebellar shrinkage. The lumbar puncture, we're looking to test for those specific antibodies, but also really looking for those indirect markers. So when I say indirect markers of inflammation, that means that the protein might be high. We may see a few white blood cells count, not hundreds, but maybe 10, 30, a lower number. And then we go hunting for cancer. Um, we really just go digging and turning over every stone. And this can be very frustrating and scary process for the patients because every scan is more anxiety, more wondering. And in a weird way for this condition, if depending on what cancer we can find, if you look at the treatment, the treatment for the ataxia is really to find the tumor or cancer and treat it, treat it, treat it. That is number one, two, and three. That takes priority over any of the immunotherapy. Um, it's We use the immunotherapy often in this condition, but the um, use of immunotherapy doesn't often change the, um, the progression depending on what's causing the perineoplastic syndrome. And of note, we talked about your body is surveying, looking for you know, infection, but also it's looking for tumor cells and it's better at finding tumor cells than doctors are. And so 80% of the time, the patients with this condition, we will not know of a diagnosis of cancer. So the symptoms of ataxia often come before we have a diagnosis of cancer and that's where we go looking. And we kind of step outside of a typical workup, the typical cancer screening. You're out of that algorithm, like your primary care doctor maybe checks for colonoscopy, says they're good for 10 years. Well, guess what? We may need to do it sooner than 10 years if you develop this um, these symptoms. And so with an updated um, uh, classification, it is now recommended that the term be called perineoplastic rapidly progressive cerebellar syndrome. And so this panel um, was put together by a group of experts in this condition and to help um, make a diagnosis of perineoplastic neurologic symptoms. And so it, ataxia is just one of the perineoplastic neurologic diseases. There are other ones. Um, we talked about the opsoclonus myoclonus. So when I say perineoplastic, it means it's associated with a tumor or cancer. But there are certain presentations that show up that clinicians can say, hey, I need to go looking for cancer at this point. And uh, rapid onset of ataxia is one of those um, clinical presentations. And so when we test for certain antibodies, certain antibodies have a higher 
risk of being associated with cancer. So if you have one of those antibodies, that gives you certain points. And then there are lower risk ones that may or may not be associated with cancer. And then, um, which can be quite overwhelming, thinking about all these antibodies, there's so many of them, it's like antibody soup. And then finally, we go looking for the cancer. And so um, of note, just because you have a negative workup at the very beginning, you should still undergo workup for cancer at a more routine workup, which is recommended three to six months, depending on the results of your initial scans. And so, and be followed for two years to make sure, because like I mentioned, the ataxia usually predates what we're able to find for cancer. And then we move to anti-GAD ataxia. Um, which I tend to see probably this is one of the more common ones. Now, stiff person spectrum disorder is on a um, spectrum with the GAD-associated ataxia. So Celine Dion here, Canadian superstar, um, became a spokesperson for this similar condition. And I just bring that up because the treatment often overlaps. And sometimes we'll also see, at least for my patients with GAD-associated ataxia, some stiff person um, symptoms like back spasms and things like that, um, or seizures. And so typically um, these patients have a little bit more going on than just ataxia, at least that I've seen. Um, I've had a number of patients with like focal spasms of the face, which tended to be uh, focal seizures. Um, so that's something to look for too, to get an EEG. And as I mentioned, it tends to occur with a family history of autoimmune disease, such as vitiligo, which is pictured here. And so the diagnosis can be made um, with antibody testing on the blood or cerebral spinal fluid, um, MRI brain should be done. And then we often test for cancer, though it's not as likely to be associated with a malignancy as the um, other antibodies that we talked about. And so the immune therapies are there and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail because there is a little bit more evidence that we can borrow from the stiff person spectrum disorder treatment. So the symptomatic therapies include benzodiazepines. However, if your balance is very bad, I do not recommend using these because it's essentially a glass of wine in pill form. And so if your balance is already off, taking one of these is going to worsen that. And I've been frustrated by insurance companies trying to get IVIG approved and they said, give them Valium, give them, you know, Baclofen first before you reach for IVIG. And in my opinion, I think sometimes these potential treatments are dangerous for my patients who have ataxia without the spasms. So IVIG, I borrow the data from stiff person spectrum disorder, which is a little sloppy to do that, but there just isn't really a lot in GAD um, ataxia. And so I use IVIG at high doses for at least monthly, about for every three months for my patients to try. Then there's also conflicting evidence whether rituximab is helpful. There was a negative study for stiff person spectrum disorder, but then case series that said it is helpful. Um, and then IV steroids in older literature has been uh, purported, but I am kind of plus or minus the IV steroids. Maybe I'll give it with the first treatment, um, just given that steroids have a lot of side effects of given chronically. Then there was this one study of a stem cell transplant. However, I do not recommend this to my patients as the primary outcome of this study was um, looking, it was kind of a weird primary outcome. They were looking at responders, which are those who could reduce their um, therapies, the symptomatic therapies. And that's kind of a weird thing to go by because I do know patients who still have symptoms, but they'd rather have the symptoms of their disease than the side effect of drugs. And so by using whether or not they can reduce their symptomatic therapies, I think that's kind of a strange thing to go by. And this group also um, was uh, had some questionable reporting of adverse events. And so in general, right now, I'm not typically recommending that for my patients. And then finally, there's this entity called primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia. So maybe you're listening to this talk and you're like, but I have an antibody and you didn't even mention it yet. What about me? And so there is a, a place for you, a group. <laughs> and um, so the primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia presents similar to other conditions with balance problems, slurred speech, usually subacute meaning days to months. And you have the same similar workup that we've proposed for these other conditions and treatment may overlap. There was actually 
a study looking at mycophenolate in patients with this, and that was um, showed some improvement. So mycophenolate is a little more specific for this group because there's more data. And this diagnosis was also proposed by a group of experts back in 2020. And so as we know, we talked about the ones with the known trigger and the primary autoimmune ataxia, we may not know the trigger or um, the antibody has maybe yet to be discovered, or maybe it's an antibody that just hasn't been that well studied yet in the literature. And so the way to look for it is doing those tests that we talked about, the MRI plus the time course, and then we look and rule out other more uh, well-established triggers and antibodies. And then um, your spinal tap, it's important to your as you can see, the spinal tap will show some markers of inflammation. And so doing it, a lumbar puncture or spinal tap is, I think, very important for evaluating all these causes. And I think it's somewhat underdone. And then, of course, excluding other causes. And once you have this as the condition, these are some of the antibodies that have been proposed as being under the umbrella of the primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia. And so, but um, there are are other treatments besides the pharmacologic treatments that I discussed and immune therapies that I discussed. So these are some practical tips that you can try. So for patients with double vision, you may find you just sort of start closing your eye because it's easier to read or see um, without having double vision, which can be caused by these conditions. So there are different types of eye patches. This is a band-aid that I will sometimes recommend because a lot of patients get embarrassed by wearing, you know, one of those pirate band like eye patches. They have these in different skin colors so that you can have a little bit more discreet um, patch, which is a band-aid. Um, of course, walkers. So I do want to caution about walkers with wheels. So if you have a walker with wheels that just goes automatically, that can be dangerous. So using an old fashioned walker or one that we call a reverse brake walker, which means you have to actually squeeze it to let it go if you have mild ataxia. Otherwise the ones with wheels can be sometimes dangerous. So walking with somebody is really usually the safest thing. There are gate belts to help. And then finally feeding yourself, that can be so frustrating for so many patients. So using weighted spoons or just bowls, it's okay if you're messy, um, you know, it's more important that you get the nutrition. And speaking of which, so speech therapy, making sure you're swallowing safely, physical therapy, occupational therapy, we know in general, a healthy body is a healthy brain. And we also know that exercise treats depression, which I mentioned is common. And so I try to get my patients in for several sessions. Um, so usually you, when you prescribe physical therapy, you'll get a session, the physical therapist will be with you, you improve, maybe plateau, and then you stop. And if you're anything like me, um, accountability for exercise can be challenging. So by having somebody there to nag you by spending that time to do the physical therapy, people tend to get better. And then when they're asked to do it alone, it kind of peters out. And so then when people get a little worse from not doing it, I will send them back again as a little booster. And same thing with occupational therapy and speech therapy too. And sometimes um, you can get that approved in the house in the United States, you need to have, which is so silly, an in-person visit within 90 days of the order for home physical therapy, at least that's how it is in Illinois, which I find incredibly frustrating because we now have telemedicine. I can see my patients, but I know that they're in a wheelchair and still they need to come in to get home therapies approved, which I think is ridiculous. Um, and then finally, we of course want to treat the trigger and that can be very challenging for patients who have a cancer that was found. The um, therapies can be um, hard on the patient. And so that's also working with the oncologist is important if you have a perineoplastic symptom. And then finally, focusing on also other symptoms that you might be dealing with. And so I want to give a shout out for palliative care. Palliative care does not mean that you're giving up. Hospice does not mean that you're giving up. There's always something to be done. And in fact, in patients with lung cancer, palliative care was associated with a longer length of life. So getting those services early, basically having a as many people looking at you and helping to help you live um, the highest quality of life that you can early on is associated with, um, you know, better outcomes sometimes even for lung cancer patients. Um, and then for hospice, I usually think of these services if the patient does not want to do physical therapy anymore. So 
between palliative versus hospice services. And so if you are like, well, I don't even want to do physical therapy or certain things, like then we consider um, hospice services, which can help you improve your quality of life. So those are important things to be tied in, especially palliative care early on. Um, you know, what is the difference? Sometimes I think of myself as a neurologist, also palliative care doctor in the sense that I'm trying to palliate my patient's symptoms and help them to feel better. Um, sometimes it's better to have a whole team though. So in summary, it is hard to have ataxia. You are strong um, and there is always something that can be done. Um, diagnosing sooner and treating sooner tends to be better. It takes a village to diagnose and treat. Um, for those who have family members with us, thank you for supporting those patients. Um, new discoveries are made every year and um, you can feel better. And there's um, the more uh, information on research and different ways to get involved. Um, Dr. Honorat, who really helped to define this field, will be speaking um, for the National Ataxia Foundation on June 26th. And I understand too, that there's a registry for acquired ataxias. Um, so visit the website. Um, so thank you so much. And I got through it all with some time to answer some questions, so. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we jump into Q&A. Uh, the patient registry that Dr. Wittick was um, mentioning is the CORDS registry that you can find out more about through the National Ataxia Foundation. Uh, one of our staff members will drop a link to the CORDS registry, which is a way to uh, join a confidential list of folks who are interested in participating in various kinds of research focusing on ataxia and more specifically immune-mediated ataxia. So if that's something that interests you, there's more information available online. Uh, additionally, if you have any questions, we're about to go through them. So again, you can submit your questions by going to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and typing your question in. So we already have a few that have come yeah, in. Yeah, it's like some good ones. Yeah, so how about we start with this one? Is there any overlap between autoimmune and hereditary ataxias, perhaps an epigenetic impact? Uh, the speak the questioner is wondering if any breakthroughs in genetic ataxias could be helpful for immune-mediated ataxias. Um, good question. So we mentioned doing HLA typing can be helpful for certain types of immune-mediated ataxia, as well as a rare type of ataxia called ataxia teleinjectasia sometimes can have some um, challenges on the immune system. So I think that doing genetic testing in particular, not just looking for, well, is it going to increase the risk for immune-mediated ataxia, but for my patient. So for example, I had a patient who was diagnosed with perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration, uh, you know, 10 years ago, inherited it because I am the IVIG person at my uh, movement disorder group. And something was just not it, it just didn't make sense. The time course, he still continued to slowly get worse and had some fasciculations and some other things. And so I asked my genetic counselor, can we, he had genetic testing in the past too. Can we look again? And then we found a SCAR12 um, mutation. And it kind of shows that in that antibody that he had in the beginning that was associated was later discovered to be, you know, maybe had a higher false positivity rate, which made me think of that. So sometimes patients may be diagnosed because of the false positivity of an antibody with immune-mediated ataxia, but later on may actually have a genetic condition. And so I often will test my patients for genetic ataxias, especially because it's becoming more cost-effective to do so. And so it just helps us for prognosis to be sure. I don't test all of my patients with immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia with genetic causes, but, um, you know, if there's something that just makes me, you know, question it or the time course and just make sure um, that we're not missing something because groups like the National Ataxia Foundation are so involved and have um, it's helpful to know exactly where your people are, to have your support groups, to know what research studies are available to you. And so I am testing more and more patients with for genetic ataxia. And then that goes on. I think there was a question about the prevalence of GAD65 antibodies across mm -hmm. the general population. So very good question. Let me see. Um, I am just going to see if I can find, I have additional slides and maybe too far down. Um, 
uh, yes, I don't have it on here, but um, so there was a recent paper that looked at misdiagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And in that paper, they reported the GAD65 antibodies as high as 8% of the population. And so in general, when we think about GAD associated taxia, not always, but in general, I'm seeing levels of titers that are off the charts. And if somebody is already getting IVIG, we know that's pooled antibodies. So it's likely that you're going to have a GAD65 antibody that may be associated with that. So sometimes I'll see them at lower titers. Um, and what I do in that case, we'll test them right after the IVIG and then right before the IVIG. And you can actually see the titers drop as the IVIG wears off. And so that's one way of kind of piecing out, well, I mean, my doctor tested the antibody as I'm receiving antibodies. Sometimes that happens because somebody else already started IVIG for a reason. And so if you're unsure, usually low titers and ones that um, wean off after the IVIG wears off tend to be associated like false positive, in my opinion. Um, that's a very common referral for me is, you know, this patient has a positive antibody, it doesn't mean anything. And so we really have quite to go, complex. <laughs> yeah. You have to go through a careful history and everything, um, given that it changes things. Mm -hmm. um, Our next question is a few people have a very similar question. What? How many people in the world have immune-mediated ataxias? And amongst the immune-mediated ataxias, which ones are the most common? Yes. So that, I kind of got to the prevalence question in mm -hmm. one of my slides. So in general, we think uh, one of the estimates is 150,000 people with ataxia overall. And one of the highest prevalence um, reported groups was about 28% of those patients, which I think is a little high. Uh, I think it depends on your clinic, what you're seeing. And so that one study that looked at idiopathic, meaning ataxia is that we don't know what the cause is. They found that the celiac associated ataxia was the most common. In my clinical practice, I see more GAD65 associated ataxia personally. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's hard to, but I haven't done a, a study of you know the prevalence, but in general, what's reported in the literature is that the celiac associated ataxia is the most common mm -hmm. cause of that. And then for perineoplastic syndrome, 1% of all cancers are thought to be associated with perineoplastic syndrome. So of course it's you know hard to quantify, but it's sometimes hard to keep all the numbers and keep things up to date exactly, and things like that. Well, it's also, changed. they're so different um, mm -hmm. in how they're characterized. And so even though they all fall under that umbrella, clearly, as you can see, they're unique disorders from unique triggers and um, mm -hmm. different treatments too. And then just before we move on on the questions, another note that unfortunately we only have the Q&A function for questions. So if you've raised your hand, we won't be able to unmute you. So if you could please put your question in the Q&A window, we'll be able to get to it. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, we have a attendee here who, could you elaborate a little bit on how uh, immune ataxia could be reversible based on treatment? Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So. What, so let's say we have a patient who has a tumor and we find that tumor and it's associated with a perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. Theoretically, if we can treat that tumor, remove the cancer, whichever it is, then we can stop that immune attack against the cancer. Then the immune system should theoretically quiet down and then the ataxia should at least plateau hopefully get better. There are different, based on the antibodies, um, different outcomes. So for example, anti-Yo tends to have one of the toughest prognosis and um, not the best prognosis, whereas other types like Casper too, I had a patient who had ataxia um, and was treated um, with immunotherapy. And although we didn't find the cancer for that patient, we're treating with rituximab and his ataxia has now resolved. And so with chronic immunotherapy, um, this patient is doing better and you know can have full resolution depending on what type of cause you have. Which brings me to, I just wanna address the question about Tuximab insurance approval. So of course this is unique to the United States. I'm sorry for everyone joining internationally, but it's very important So <laughs> in, for people in the United States. So I battle with insurance companies all the time. I hate to say it that way, but uh, sometimes we will just send patients to the hospital and say, okay, well, their symptoms have gotten worse. 
and we can't do these outpatient therapies and send them in for either additional workup. And at that time, they can start an infusion for rituximab and see if the patient gets better. Um, mm -hmm. It is, yeah, it's frustrating. And I'm sorry to hear that you're having that difficulty. And mm -hmm. it's hard because the insurance company says, well, it's experimental because yeah. the studies are not really done for this. And I'm like, well, they're all technically experimental because it's a the rare condition. So we mm -hmm. don't have uh, a lot of data to rely on for this. Um, it can be hard to find participants in order to get the numbers needed, in order to justify to the insurance companies that they should be paying in order to uh, use yeah. these treatments for folks. And it's also hard for clinical equipoise is a term that we use as mm -hmm. researchers to say, well, is placebo, do we not know, is placebo just as good at giving these other therapies mm -hmm. that have been reported in literature? So we don't want to do a study if we believe well enough that there is a, you know, a treatment that's already mm -hmm. available that we can already give, if that yeah. makes sense. So so we have time for about two more questions. Uh, just going down the list here, uh, someone's interested, this is specifically about uh, gluten ataxia. How soon after starting a gluten-free diet do people start seeing improvement, if any at all? Yeah, so usually you start to see the improvement within days to weeks is what I've seen for some patients who start it. So, um, but if you haven't started seeing that improvement, if you're able to stick with it for at least some months, because it can take some time for the immune system to calm down for mm -hmm. the And then we have another sort of clarification question about terminology. So is immune-mediated ataxia idiopathic? Could you clarify that a little bit? So immune-mediated ataxia is not idiopathic. Idiopathic means we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way... Um, the primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia is not technically idiopathic. We just don't mm -hmm. know what the trigger is, but mm -hmm. so we have terms now for it. So immune mediated cerebellar ataxia is a specific cause of ataxia. And then there are different subtypes for it. And when we don't know if it doesn't fit into one of those other subtypes, and maybe there's a different you know, like we talked about, if you go down the algorithm, you might fit into the primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia because mm -hmm. you didn't have one of those other conditions, but there was enough features there based on your workup that suggests that you are having an autoimmune attack against your cerebellum. So maybe someone who is in early process of being diagnosed, maybe hasn't been referred to a movement disorder specialist yet. The first sort of, uh, label they may receive is idiopathic ataxia. And then with more tests over time, they'll be like, oh no, now we better understand what's happening. We better yeah. understand the root cause. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. And then the percentage, like I mentioned in that prospective, I'm just reading this one question is oh, of course. Um, as high as 28% of the patients. Sometimes, yeah, there's been some higher reports depending on the group that you're looking at mm -hmm. that are actually autoimmune or the immune mediated cerebellar ataxia. Fantastic. And those answers were quite concise. So I think we have time for one final question. Perhaps we'll end on this one. Uh, so we have a uh, attendee here who uh, her husband has some kind of ataxia and they're having so much trouble trying to find a doctor to diagnose it who will look into it at all. Why might a doctor may be reluctant to give an ataxia diagnosis? So I'm really sorry about that experience. That must be so frustrating. And I'm sorry that you're not unique in that. And a lot of patients do have, um, not patients, the providers have neurophobia, <laughs> I find. So maybe medicine doctors or people who are not neurologists may be actually uh, overwhelmed when it comes to looking at the nervous system. I, sh I showed a slide in the beginning of all the different causes of attacks. Mm -hmm. It can be very overwhelming for people who maybe do not have a background in movement disorders, or just getting knowing where to get started. And so I'm sorry to hear that. Um, hopefully within your state, because there's telemedicine, if you're in the United States, can access a subspecialist, you just go in for one time and do telemedicine if it's hard in your area to find a specialist. But sadly, I will have patients fly in too mm. from, throughout the United States, not just for ataxia, but other conditions, because there's a bit of a shortage of movement disorder specialists. And if you are joining us from outside of the United States on the National Ataxia Foundation website, we have a list of uh, ataxia centers and movement disorder specialists uh, from around the world to give you a starting point. If you need to get a second opinion or want to learn more, there's options and resources on there. Yes. And with that, 
we are at time. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you again. Everyone can join me at, in your individual Zoom screens, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Wittek for joining us today and for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. And again, this uh, recording will be made live on the Ataxia, National Ataxia Foundation YouTube page in a couple of weeks. And yeah, thank you so much for spending your time with us wherever you are in the world. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And then I will just try to answer the other ones if that's okay. The email, is that all right? I just see some questions I didn't get to yet, if that's okay. Uh, once we end the call, they will disappear. But if anyone has any questions they would like to contact yeah. Dr. Wittick with, uh, please feel free to reach out to research at ataxia.org and we will pass those on to her. Yes, yeah, sorry I couldn't answer everything. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye everyone. All right, thanks, bye.